welcome listeners. Not So Giant Women is here. And this week we are keeping it together. Yes, tackling keeping it together today. So we had a little trollishness with the previous Rise and Tides Crashing Skies title. And here we have another one that is not particularly forthcoming as to what it's going to be about when we're pretty used to relatively literal titles. So, I mean, I don't know if you have any thoughts about this one. Yeah, I mean, literal titles. The other, only a couple of weeks ago, I was editing Stephen the Swordfighter and what's that about? So, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's Stephen's not, Lion and whatnot. <laughs> yeah, it's not as potentially trollish as Rising Tides, Crashing Skies because it doesn't even tell us that much. And I guess I'd yeah. say maybe keeping the team together. We haven't had mm-hmm. a the team structure is upset story for a while. I guess unless you count Amethyst tantrum a few episodes back, but I sort of saw that as a Amethyst thing rather than the team is having difficulties as a team thing. Your mileage may vary. Yeah. But let's find out. Yay. We are the crystal gems. We'll always save the day. Right. They belong together. If I could begin to be Wow. <sighs> oh fudge, viewers. <gasps> yeah. Some heavy stuff going on. Uh-huh. <laughs> Let's see how we go. Uh, we open on a fairly light note as we recap where we are <laughs> of Paradot and do some laundry. Pearl has put herself on every quarter of the chore wheel, <laughs> realizing that one of Peridot's to-do lists involved the kindergarten. Our heroes leave the laundry. Oh, Stephen also tries to persuade Garnet to unfuse to give them more folders, but she says she's not unfusing for laundry, which is a lot funnier when Estelle says it than when I say it. And uh-huh. they walk pad to the kindergarten, and we also have un- underscored that Stephen is well and truly part of the Crystal Gems team, so that was lovely to... We kind of felt it, but it was nice to see them say it to him on screen. Went to his head a bit, but that's Stephen. <laughs> Upon arriving at the kindergarten, they realised the injectors, the machinery that makes the kindergarten work, is all still dormant. And even after Peridot's recent visit, none of the injectors have been turned on. There's a brief to-do with Peridot who uses her finger things in a helicopter to fly away. While Amethyst and Pearl are chasing after Peridot, Garnet and Stephen realise Peridot must be up to something else and journey down to that control chamber we saw earlier. So now there are things pulled out from the wall, these cylinders of rock, and Peridot has made references to fusions and heavies, and they stumble across, or rather stumbling across them almost literally, is a hand and a foot of different colours, sort of, I'd say, stitched together, except they're not really stitched. If one had to use a word, one might say fused, and that's about to become relevant. They're kind of like, what the gem is this? And investigate the cylinders, and they soon burst out all around with real house of abominations, stuff like limbs stuck to other limbs and bits of bodies in different bright colours. And we see some bits of gem shards stuck together, like literally as if they were forced together. Some kind of defuse and refuse and try to form body shapes. We almost briefly see faces, but they disappear again. And then it's a hand, then it's a hand with hands, and you've really got to see it to realise how screwed up this all is. This hits Garnet to the core, and why wouldn't it? She's both a fusion and, well, let's face it, she's a, also a person and is pretty disgusting on both those levels. The struggle with the whatever these other things are called almost prizes Garnet apart. She starts to semi unfuse. She sort of goes into that light shape mode that gems do when they are fusing and unfusing and starts to split but eventually reforms, quelling the monsters for a moment. They realize these are shards of gems, not just the gems, but the crystal gems, i.e., their former teammates. Their gems had been shattered and sharded and literally forced together to try to make fusions and well it 
has not worked. They're just making, as far as we can tell, monsters of body parts. We can't even tell if they've got any mind left. The faces we briefly saw seem terrified. So what's left to feel that we don't know. Garnet is appalled because fusion should never be forced and probably even less happy with it given these are her former friends and teammates and that these aren't just gems fused together they've been crammed together in some weird victor frankenstein david cronenberg way she explains this to Stephen, though it's already getting pretty clear how horrible this is and garnet has a bit of a conversation with herself that you can't quite be sure if it's her halves speaking through her or just her talking to herself in a very dramatic fashion. Maybe it's both. The other two arrive, say they couldn't catch Peridot, and we have to bubble and capture all these things. And I guess they do because then we jump back to the giant statue hand where they keep the laundry equipment. Garnet's chilling there. Stephen warps in with some laundry and they sort of, talk a bit i guess she kind of vents over the whole notion in as much as garnet vents Stephen asks as many viewers have how they get power or plumbing to the washer and dryer and garnet just says <laughs> magic which i think is probably rebecca's sugar's actual answer for it <laughs> and a bit more about herself and fusions in general she is a chosen fusion of ruby and sapphire's love she still exists as their love when they're separate and because their love is so strong, that's how she's who she is and how she, who she is for so long. And yeah, that's the meat of this week's rather House of horrors episode. Yeah. When we were discussing the time to sit down and do this episode, I sent Daria, listeners, I sent Daria a picture of me after I saw this episode. <laughs> mm. That was after I saw this. And I look kind of, I don't know, horrified and haunted. Yeah. And I captioned it something like, don't tell me it's just a cartoon or something. I was very, you know, strongly affected by this episode. I didn't expect this to happen. You know, it was, it's really a very, I love this episode and it's still so hard to watch. You know, oh yeah. I, I was having some, some pretty visceral reactions. There was yeah. some, some, this is not Okay. <laughs> things yeah. really going on yeah and that's kind of exacerbated by how we have been trained for 60 episodes now to understand that garnet is she's stoic she's unemotional she is a fighter she's always going to have everything under control and then this freezes her and paralyzes her and we will follow that lead like the strongest you know, most unflappable person on the team is reacting like this. This must be something absolutely horrifying. Yeah, and double horrifying, if you'll pardon the pun, because it's related to fusion. Yes. And you can tell how horrible this is just as a concept, but it has an extra blow for Garnet as they've perverted what she is. Yeah, like just what she stands for and the foundation of her very existence is turned into this twisted, torturous thing you know, that she's having to see this and find out what became of people that she knew that they're being tortured in this way. And yeah. and that's kind of the triple blow that these aren't just random gems. These are yes. crystal gems and definitely in the sense of crystal gems are the team we've come to know and love and kind of answers explicitly the question of has Rose's rebellion just been this handful of people all this time? And the answer is no. We're looking at the survivors and the stowaway. Yes. Right. There, there was a line in there. And dozens, if not hundreds of others fell, yeah. died, were shattered. Yeah, yeah. They don't come right out and explain that to us, of course, but you know, Garnet making a comment about that these are the remains that they never found. They were clearly looking for them. Mm. And we know enough now to know that shards of a gem mean a gem was shattered and when a gem shattered a gem is dead right gems tend not to shatter peacefully in their sleep yeah i guess like we saw some gem shards in that episode secret team which a lot of people saw as filler and we saw them become limbs that crawled all over the temple Mm, i was remembering that yeah this is very similar to that although they were tied together they were stuck together i don't know how that was done but it looked like they couldn't get apart so they were 
made into this gestalt creature yeah. that was clearly very uncomfortable. <laughs> I guess sometimes a gem shard can spark up that little bit after shattering and make an arm or something, but this was, well, I guess we don't know what the unknown process is, but that's part of the point because it's a new thing to try to, I guess, to try to grow super soldiers in the form of would-be fusions under the general fusions are usually stronger idea and oh here's all our fallen enemies that we can just experiment the hell on well wait i have loads more probing questions to ask actually i was thinking i mean it's awfully early in the discussion to do that but i was thinking of what kind of probing question i wanted to ask you for this and i was i was thinking what would you what would you guess that they were trying to do what was their goal in doing this to them like i mean was it more like do you think it was more like it was a punishment or do you think it was more like they were actually trying to make something useful? Well, useful to them anyway, partly due to right. paradox, offhanding, offhandly, offhand, I don't know what the adjective is, in an offhand manner of mentioning heavies, <laughs> which suggests, well, big, tough creatures of some kind. So I'm guessing it was trying to create some kind of big soldier or super soldier of some kind. Hmm. If Peridot is all the way in on this, that's seriously dark for someone we've kind of framed as a mid-management pen pusher all this time. Right. And she was very funny in this, like very slapstick and laughing and saying cartoon villain things. So she looked awfully goofy to be masterminding something horrific like this. Yeah. And as for whether it's punishment, I think it's kind of for whoever came up with this, presumably someone high up the gem chain. Whether right at the top, of, I given she was making a report about it, I don't think it's Peridot's actual plan from, mm -hmm. I don't think she came up for it all by herself. I think she's enacting it for someone just from the way she was reporting. Yeah, yeah. she but, was getting her data. Yeah, but whoever came up with it might have thought, oh, that'll take some That'll take some doing, but, you know, we can't just experiment on our own people or where are we going to get all the shattered gems and shards and effectively dead bodies from? And someone said, oh, well, here are all our fallen enemies. Do what the hell you want to them. Yeah. We don't have a gem need for convention. You can experiment and squash their parts together and they're disposable <laughs> and you can do horrible, awful things to them. So I think it's a bit of a nice trick shot for whoever came up with that. Look, we can punish the memory of our enemies and we can try to do whatever this project ultimately is. And there's yeah. also the part that the, the abominations, fusions, heavies, whatever, did actually seem pretty strong. So there is that fundamental. Mm -hmm. If they're trying to make super strong soldiers, they've, uh, they've succeeded on the strong part at least. Yeah. It, yeah. Even though it was partly her emotional freak out, Garnet, who's usually the strongest, was having trouble holding her own against them. Yeah. It didn't seem like she actively tried to battle it very much at all, so much as she mm -hmm. just punched it at the end and pulled yeah. it apart. Uh, as I said, the emotional freak out and possibly a bit of, can I battle this? Is this what's left of my friends? Is there any way to reach them? What is this anyway? Do I have to put that aside because I've got to protect Stephen and or myself in the immediate moment? So yeah. she didn't seem to be doing too much. When she was literally pushing against them, they seemed fairly locked. It mm -hmm. was when she sort of got her second win and punched them. And of course, who knows what they can actually sense or think. Yeah. So I think in terms of raw strength, they're pretty up there, but what good that does anyone or anything. Right. I mean, if it was something like that I could take orders or had a goal, a shared goal of some mm -hmm. kind, probably be very formidable to fight. You know, and we've seen that Jasper's opinion on fusion is that it's, you know, it's a fighting thing. It's like, hmm. oh, hmm. you know, I'm going to have, if I have to fight a fusion, that's not really fair because, you know, it's cheating or whatever. But if I find someone to fuse with, then I'll be powerful. So it's like, I guess, a natural conclusion that the homeworld gems would think this is what fusion is about, is getting something big and strong. And from what we've seen, they're not warm and cuddly like our crystal gems. Oh. <laughs> so the idea that they're just trying to do horrible things to build an even stronger army to conquer more planets and have more wars is completely fitting. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So so far, we really have no concept for what the Homeworld Empire wants. What do they want these soldiers for? Are they fighting somebody else? You know. Yeah, we've, we've got sort of their broad track record of being conquerors and warriors, but 
whether that's got a goal other than, well, conquering and war itself, which granted wouldn't make them alone in terms of science fiction bad guys, but yeah. we're in fact in real world bad guys. But mm-hmm. but we, do, we don't know. Most of it's filtered through the Crystal Gems stories and what we've seen, the tips of uh, Jasper and Peridot. Yeah. I think now even joke this time, before we saw what horrible things she'd been up to, oh, Peridot, she's going to attack them for spreadsheet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah i gotta admit though like even though she is comical a lot you know the first time when i saw this especially when she started to come out of the ground and she was facing steven you know it's like he never really thought about well what will i do if i actually find her you know i mean it's not like you can fight her mm-hmm. and standing there face to face with her with this threat you know and it's like whoa like just my kind of had a skin crawl reaction like she's right there yeah, and mm. while she's not been much of a fighter as, as herself, as most of her battle tactics of running away or calling Jasper, one to one against Stephen with could still go badly for him. We don't know her that well. We don't know if one of the right. con- configurations with her magic fingers is like some super flesh dissolving blaster or something. Yeah, we did see the electricity thing where she electrified Amethyst's whip this week. True, um, true, yeah. That would have been maybe lethal to him. I don't know for sure. And she got crushed by one of those injectors. Like when Pearl made it seem like she missed her and then she actually hit the injector above her when she was running up the wall. Nice and it one, came Pearl. down and they like crushed her. Yeah, good job, Pearl. You'd expect nothing less with her precision. But, you know, she just throws this thing off of her and she's fine. You know, she's tough. But, you know, like you said, mostly evasive maneuvers. She's trying to get away. Which could as much be because whatever it actually is, she has a job to do. Right. And she got what she needed. And fighting the Crystal Gems is not it. Mm-hmm. Right. And you can tell from just her attitude that battle is not mm. her primary function here. Yeah, she's done okay so far, but I'm going to guess that if she really had to take the Crystal Gems on four-on-one in a flat-out battle, she'd probably come off oh. second best. Oh, boy. Yeah. Uh. I think so. But in this case, she was able to get away with her fast fingers, her, mm. her go-go gadget, Peridot Mobile. Mm. <laughs> yeah. yeah, let's see how you do without your magic cyber hands. I wonder if maybe could have caught her if she transformed into dog copter again. Oh, yeah. Maybe that's <laughs> something that happened off screen that she's tried to dog copter and just couldn't catch up. And uh, Pearl had a bit so. of a, let us never speak of this moment. <laughs> yeah, they weren't able to get her. That's funny when Garnet was holding Stephen when he was trying to run after them. And he's just motoring his little legs and she's just holding him. <laughs> that reminded me of what a friend of mine did, did with a dog once. A dog had <laughs> a dog had wandered onto our lawn, a little little puppy, obviously lost, and was trying my friend wanted to see his dog have a like a collar or a phone number or something. And the dog wanted to get away from my friend. When my friend picked up the dog, the dog was still running with its legs in the air, obviously too young to grasp if I'm picked up and my feet don't touch the floor running doesn't do any good and it was just adorable (laughs) adorable Uh, Steven's a pup yeah yeah fits checks out yeah that was a cool scene when you know when Garnet said her thing about well we're gonna be smart about this we're gonna go investigate what she was doing and Steven gives her that compliment your brains and bra on the whole package (laughs) she's so cute she goes thank you (laughs) yeah I do like her occasional absence too I guess that's why I'm so great yeah, I love that line. And it came up a couple times, once with her saying it and Stephen later saying, that's why you're so great. Yeah, there's a lot of Garnet dialogue. I wouldn't be surprised if this was the most she's ever talked in an episode. Yeah, she was pretty chatty. If, even yeah. when she's a focus, usually she doesn't get to actually say much. Right. Like if you think about the episode Future Vision, like she still didn't really talk that much. But right from the beginning, you know, it's her voice first and she's explaining the mission and she's volunteering information. Mm. And um, Pearl or Amethyst couldn't have explained fusion on the level that she did. Right. I love that Stephen has clearly been thinking about this since he met Ruby and Sapphire and he's been wanting to ask her like, oh my gosh, you know, this person that I've known my whole life is made up of two people I don't really know. And it, he's been pondering the whole nature of her existence and probably thinking about some of the sort of sad side of that is that he doesn't get to know those two. He has Garnet, but he doesn't have Ruby and Sapphire. And like, just like if Steven were to fuse with Connie and 
live as Stevani, like a lot of people would miss Stephen and Connie. So it's like, yeah. it's really complicated. And he's still on the uphill because when he was Stevani, he was only fused for like a few hours. Yeah. So he doesn't really sort of miss out on being just Stephen for very long at all. So I think he's a bit concerned right. that these two individuals are missing out on being these two individuals. Right. And he said that thing about do you for, when you fuse, like, do you forget who you used to be? And, you know, that he's been wondering these really hard questions and he's curious about how it works. Like, oh, is the strong part of you Ruby and is this wise part of you Sapphire? And she's trying to explain, like, she's the entity that results from that. She's all of both and yeah. she's not them. So yeah. And confirming some stuff we've conjectured explicitly right. that it's not it's not just like some split down the middle half and half thing it's everything in together that may yeah. show itself in different ways yeah and it is it, i mean it's obviously an alien concept because it's not something that humans can do but like the sort of idea that steven well when, when he's asking her questions about fusion and she kind of tries to dodge it at first and says well you fused and he's thinking like i've been a component i haven't been the result like what's that like mm -hmm. That's really deep, you know? I think that's also her saying, oh, I know what the viewers are about to say. <laughs> yeah. But... Which I think also, <laughs> even though that might have been a bit of hand wave, it also underscores that living as a fusion is different from fusing for a short amount of time. I mean, right. no, other, no other fusion we've seen has been together for as long as, as Garnet has. I mean, even if Malachite right. is still Malachite under the ocean, that's still shorter time. Yep. And Malachite has her own problems anyway. So it's probably best right. not to use her as any kind of comparison for anything. Right. The length of time that she is together does not speak of the quality of their relationship. But Gardner was able to effectively explain to Stephen that the individuals, in her case, Ruby and Sapphire, aren't lost, that if they weren't wanting to do this, it wouldn't be so. Right. And it, because she embodied their love. Yeah, and they're very closely fused. Obviously, yeah. they don't just get distracted and come apart like Opal. Right. Yeah, it's much weirder for them to come apart. It would have to be something drastic. Mm. And I guess the implication was when she was going through this, she was falling apart a little bit, and that implies that they, you know, they were losing their cohesiveness, or that maybe they felt differently about what was going on. Mm. Which also, seemed to be somewhat confirmed by that conversation she had with herself, which I interpreted as they're not unfused, but they're separately conversing mm. with one mouth, which is yeah. weird. A bit Gollum and Smeagol for those who have seen Lord of the Rings. Yeah. Yeah. They even used that sort of same camera angle thing that mm. that they did in those movies. But we've seen Stevani do that too, where it's clear that Connie and Steven are kind of dissociating a little bit to talk, but Stevani hasn't unfused. Yeah. And... It could also be, and this doesn't go against what we just said, that they might have been in just freaking out so badly that they it was just shutting them down altogether. Because this is the right. most emotional trauma we've seen Garnet under. Yes, definitely. I mean, it's a big deal. Actually, just incidentally, when we talked about cat fingers and how it was like a horror show, <laughs> I said, don't worry, you're not going to have to deal with horror on this level until episode 60. <laughs> <laughs> the sort of body horror of all of that. I think this episode uh, does what, well, if you put off by body horror entirely, then that is what it is. But I think body horror is at its most effective when you can feel it, as it were. Mm -hmm. Like the idea of doing weird stuff to someone's body is freaky enough on its own. But I think for it to be most effective, you need to sort of feel that on a personal level or understand what the person whose body is being horrored is feeling yes. or could feel and they nailed that this time mm -hmm. it was it wasn't just oh an arm and a leg stuck together that's weird it was yeah this is so screwed up especially when we saw just for a little bit that they were trying to form faces right the heads and arms and torsos and stuff trying to pull away from each other and screaming yeah so even if there's sort of 99 percent gone that one percent is terrified right they're coming to themselves after dormancy for who knows how long and they're finding themselves in some kind of confused conundrum of gestalt minds that they didn't ask to be part of and they're like what has happened to me something's happening yeah especially if and they can't form a monster 
if they can't form complete thoughts, it's going to be almost even more terrifying, like a baby or an animal that can't understand something that's happening to them, but is nonetheless scared. Right. They, I mean, I, yeah. They may not have that. They certainly wouldn't have that sapient adult comprehension of the scene that Garnet and the viewers did. Right. Yeah. I know you just saw it for the first time, but it's kind of like I saw a lot of discussion of what happened in that scene, you know, different interpretations and stuff, because it was really, it was very, very visceral, as we discussed, where you're just kind of caught up in the horror of it all. And then people are kind of analyzing it. Some people thought, okay, what is this big forced fusion trying to do to Garnet? Was it trying to fight her? Was it just flopping around trying to, you know, or did it have something. Some people thought that it was trying to absorb her, which I absolutely didn't think was happening. Um, I didn't think it was trying to absorb her, but I did wonder if Garnet was trying to keep herself together rather than just going for it and separating it. We know she, we know she can healthily separate and re- refuse. Yes. And I wondered if she resisted so hard because she feared that if she unfused, she might open herself to one of these monsters fusing with her, not necessarily by trying to per se, but just because it was just thrashing about and we saw it kind of fuse and unfuse with itself. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, trying to form a body. Yeah, so I wouldn't be surprised if part of that was I got to stay together because unfusing might open me up to if this thing just sort of lashes out its fusionness and I end up part of the... Mm-hmm. beast half bestial and unable to unfuse again so mm-hmm. i didn't think i was trying to absorb her but i thought it was a i thought undue fusion was a risk worth considering to use very mm-hmm. clinical language for a very emotional scene mm-hmm. i think if i had to guess kind of what was going on and i don't know for sure like if they were conscious enough to ascribe any thoughts to the individuals or the gestalt of the forced fusion but because garnet said that thing about them being crystal gems it was clear she knew who they were and maybe they knew who she was and i wondered if they like saw her as something familiar and were begging for her help or something you know like there's someone we know let's even though our arms are flashing around and we're gonna knock her shades off or whatever we're grabbing onto her for help or something because it seemed like they didn't throttle her or throw her or punch her Mm. or anything they were just grasping her yeah because um, see if it wanted to deal with it simply by picking her up and throwing her then right. it would simply be big enough to do that regardless of how strong she was right and it's like it's squished together gem thing in the center of the palm hand thing it had become it was almost like it was offering it up to her it was like these eyeballs were all looking at it it's like here here it is like just get me just get me out of this yeah um, and that's kind of what me. i thought Take might me. be happening Reshatter me, kill me, something me. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to be conscious right now. But, you know, that was kind of what I would guess might have happened. But I can't be sure if they were, you know, awake enough to be able to have any intentional actions. So I'm just kind of reaching a little bit there. <laughs> well, so am I of this comparison. And the idea that there wasn't much mind left reminded me of a book I once read called Unwind. Mm-hmm. In that... Someone is basically surgically dismantled for transplant parts while they're still conscious. That's kind of that book series thing. But the particular part is you get this, a third person limited at one point, to the point that Unwind fans will sort of look at each other knowingly and say, chapter 61, oh, chapter 61. And as parts of that person's brain are taken away, their thoughts and comprehensions start to break down. Mm -hmm. And one of the last complete sentences is, I can't remember my name, but I'm still here. Mm -hmm. And it just kind of reminded me of that, the idea that there is something left which is lost or frame of reference, possibly or sense of identity, any way to associate anything with anything else, no proper memory to draw from, but there's still just something left that hurts. Yeah. I guess, I mean, we as human beings do have the capacity to have pretty intense brain damage. And then when we regain something of ourselves, like if we have a coma or something, a lot of people will say, I have memories of experiencing that. They just are in an altered state of consciousness, you know? 
So yeah, maybe it's kind of like that. There's still a piece there to perceive, but it's not the whole person. Yeah. And that's what I got mostly because of the faces thing, because the granted it's partly symbolic for us, but because yeah. we see faces as identities, we primarily identify yeah. people through their faces. We use a lot of metaphors yeah. for faces, which are essentially the face is the person. So that mm-hmm. a face almost forms and then disappears again is what screened out to me that there is all there is not quite a person here but they're not quite gone right there has to be a will that's shaping that and it doesn't seem that their minds are properly fusing because we saw like i didn't count but seemed like five or so faces trying to form yeah yeah i think it was something like five and the sort of screamy noise sounded like multiple voices It kept like roaring and screaming while it was dragging itself toward her. (laughs) Yeah. And what a terrible image. How much, if anything, Garnet recognized of her fellows is up for grabs, but any answer is still pretty horrible. Yeah. Yeah. So the conversation that she had with herself, like her two, her two halves that had not completely dissociated. I feel like that happens with fusions when they're, like they're pulling away, but they're not completely disconnected. And maybe when they're feeling like that, they can't like think together and read their own mind. They have to say it out loud. And that's why she's talking to herself. That's kind of how I thought of the situation because they were still feeling very differently about what happened where the one that is the one that was the types of things that Ruby would say are, you know, was all kind of focused on guilt and anger. Like, you know, they were here the whole time. This is punishment. This is what they think of us. Whereas the one that's more, you know, Sapphire is like, this wasn't our fault. This Rose couldn't have known about this, you know? So it's kind of like blaming yourself and not blaming yourself at the same time, feeling those things simultaneously, you know? So. And it might've helped her to externalize it as an actual conversation Mm -hmm. rather than try to smack it back and forth in her own head. Yeah. In fact, I've done that to myself when I'm not a fusion. So it's a thing. I think it's a little bit similar to when we saw Opal fall apart in the episode, The Return. As soon as Opal fell apart at the sight of Steven coming back to the beach, when everyone tried to get rid of him and get him to safety, the first thing Amethyst says is, you came back. And the first thing Pearl says is, what are you doing here? Get out of here. Mm. You know? So it's kind of like, it's implied that them feeling opposite of each other disintegrated opal yeah especially with opal who are opal being a fairly shaky bond to start with right they're definitely not that great at cooperating as we saw in the fusion short (laughs) i mean opal strikes me as the sort of fusion that if she bumps her head on a low door frame will come apart and she will bump her head on a low door frame because she's that feet tall Yeah, because she defies my set scale thing by being taller than the tall people characters, but not as large as the massive fusion characters. Right. She's definitely not as big as Dougalite or Alexandrite. But she's... Or Malachite. Yeah, who are all like in the Godzilla scale. Yeah, colossal. Yeah, whereas she's taller than the tall regular people like Garnet and Rose, but not the size of a building or anything. Right. So this kind of answers Stephen's question in that episode. So are you like a regular sized woman or a giant, giant woman or a regular sized giant woman? (laughs) I think the answer is giant, giant woman, but not giant, giant, giant woman. (laughs) I don't know how giant, giant is. Speaking of the scale, everyone was looking very, a lot more sort of rubbery this week. Who was boarding? Raven and Paul. Okay. Yeah, that would explain this we had a few, I guess, Paul bodies as well as Paul faces in there. <laughs> yeah. I've also known they're the ones who tend to render Stephen and Amethyst essentially the same size, whereas most of the mm-hmm. others make her a bit taller. Mm-hmm. I think she's canonically a little bit taller than him, but mm. just depending on how they're drawn, you definitely get that. Mm. Yeah. They're usually handed these horrific episodes. So here well, they are on full display. Well, yeah, when you came to the whatever's in the control chamber, the misfusions, etc. Mm-hmm. You didn't want someone just rendering that like it was a technical drawing. Yeah. You want to get some real visceral horror in there, something really you want, disturbing you, fundamentally. You wanted a couple of artists who knew when they could bend and break the rules. So they did well choosing this lot, this one. Yeah. 
it was extremely brutal also to see the way that Garnet was coming apart too. Like there was a hole in her body that was widening and ripping her apart. Yeah. Crazy. We've not seen someone defuse like that before. It's normally right. sort of a turn into a blob of light and turn into smaller blobs of light. Right. It's usually very sudden. But I guess she was actively fighting it. She was trying to stay together. And I guess, you know, partly because she was stronger that way and, you know, doesn't want to be apart. She doesn't want to be forced to unfuse. But what brought her back together was when Stephen said, this isn't like you. And then her eyes opened and then she pulled herself back together. Yeah. And that's pretty cool. Which meant Stephen's arc was kind of understanding that Ghana isn't just someone who fuses and unfuses for fun. This is yeah. very fundamental to who she is. Right, exactly. I mean, she said it flippantly, but she was not unfusing for laundry. And she meant that. She's not going to just unfuse for, for that. Yeah. And I think Stephen um, also just simply has a childish fascination of wanting to see the two little people that make up the big people. Right. And I'm sure at this point he would like to know more about who they are because he only met them briefly in crisis and then they disappeared as soon as they found each other. Mm. I'm sure he'd like to know more about them, you know, whereas they feel that they already know him because they they have Garnet's memories. So hmm. it's did also the very first scene almost went with my you could show the previous episode to someone to catch them up thing because they just give us the last little bits of and we're looking for someone called this because this and this is where we're at with it. That's right. Yeah. We need to find Peridot. We found her pod. She came here with a job to do. And she's going to do it. So we got to yeah. stop her. Yeah. I like that opening to the pile, the massive pile of shirts. Which are all identical, of course. Yes. And Amethyst would like people to stop wearing clothes. Yes. Which she <laughs> thinks would be funny. And that, that's Amethyst all over. Yeah. The chore wheel thing was also cute with, at first it kind of seems like somebody else stuck Pearl with all of the chores, but then you realize she put herself on all the chores. I just like doing all those things. Of course you do, Pearl. Amethyst is kind of a Everybody troll. Everybody kind of has their own, yeah. Amethyst is kind of a troll because she could easily make her default form unclothed. So obviously she just wants to mess up other people being unclothed. 100%. <laughs> I wonder why she would think it's funnier for humans to not wear clothes. Mm-hmm. She's, well, we know her taste in television. She's pro- probably seen enough of those old comedies where someone's trousers fall down for no reason and the canned laughter goes wild. That's true. And, you know, I guess butts can be funny in any culture. Yeah, yeah. For all her maturity, she's still actually not very mature. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I like how on display the different kind of physical act acting each of the characters does is in that opening scene where they're each kind of folding things differently it's, it's oh, very cool a, each that's of them, a cool thing to know yeah. Move. yeah they yeah. move they move in a very defined way i mean you know pearl obviously has a very effective neat way of doing it and steven's kind of like tucking it up under his shirt and sticking his tongue out like trying to fold things and you know he's like struggling with it a little bit he's also like a child imitating an adult who's shown them do it like this without so who hasn't sort of got the muscle memory of actually doing it yet right i really like how that how that really it it just makes it feel like they're real people who are living and have different relationships with interacting with the world. I just, I love those little touches. I noticed them most with Pearl because she is very particular about the way her limbs are arranged. She's very deliberate mm-hmm. about it. And her, her hands are always very sort of gracefully arranged. Yeah. She is um, all very, she is beauty. Careful. She is grace. Yeah. And, and in fact, Amethyst, Amethyst, is the opposite. <laughs> Amethyst embodies herself by just not folding at all at first. Yeah. She was reading, she was reading manga. Yeah. I saw that. Was it, pretty hairstylist or something i didn't quite catch that because i was also having a note of oh look there's all the many many reddish pink shirts again yeah i'm just trying to remember i know that that exists in this universe but i can't remember if that was what she was reading right then pretty hairstylist i don't know it's some some comics (laughs) yeah so my my big two like takeaways from this episode i've already talked about one of them was like how how well they set up Garnet being horrified by this to help us feel more horrified after, you know, I mean, when you, well, I've heard before one of the rules of writing is, you know, say if you have a character that is 
regal and always very respectable and stuff, a really good way to make things funny is to is to do something embarrassing to that character and like take that away from them briefly. So I mean that also works with make something make somebody who's never scared of anything and then scare them mm. and you you wait 60 episodes to do it so people really know that you mean it like if it wasn't already so scary to look at you would know that this is so horrifying especially to her because of her you know being a fusion and seeing as soon as she sees like what are these two gems stuck together and she's making these sounds like she's she's repulsed by it she's mm. having a reaction like that and it but wouldn't the, have worked the for other us if really we didn't know uh, how much it wouldn't have worked for us if we hadn't had enough experience by now to know that a gem person's core is in their gem jewel right right if this had been like episode yeah. five or something we would have thought more along the lines of oh that's pretty nasty i guess because the idea that a gem is their gem hasn't been so settled in on us yeah. And we need that. Um, we need to be so grounded in the concept that we are shocked when it's subverted. Yeah. I think they've de- definitely done that up to this point. Yeah. The other really big takeaway from this for me was how they pulled in this, this really interesting, nuanced discussion of consent. Mm, yeah. This, I mean, we know fusion is not sex. It better not be sex, but Garnet's components have a romantic relationship that mm. fusion is part of the way they express that. So it can be, you know, and it's obviously physically has to be by nature an intimate thing that they're mm. making a body together. So a lot of those consent discussions were very explicitly you know, you can't not make the comparison, you know? Yeah, I think they went just not far enough. I think if they'd gone a bit further and made it a bit more ex- explicit, it would have felt too on the nose. Yeah. And possibly also slightly disrupted the story because whatever it's a parallel to, in story, it's a different thing with its own different purpose. And if you sometimes if you make the comparison of real world thing and story thing too closely, it breaks down. I think so, especially with something like this where you're seeing children doing it or somebody's guardians encouraging him to fuse with them in the living room you know i mean if you go too far with that then that is you just showed something you should never show on television or participate in (laughs) and at first i thought garnet was going to flat out call it a violation which it is but it's also Mm -hmm. become known to many viewers that violation is the word you say when you want to say rape but you're in a kid's show or in mm-hmm. a show where you can't otherwise say that. Mm-hmm. And I think that would have taken it just that bit too far into the metaphor and mm-hmm. thus taken away from the story because the real world metaphor has no making super soldiers comparison. It just doesn't work. Right. And it's not pieces of bodies and it's not dead people that you once knew. And mm. yeah. And also this way, the idea of consent becomes more general which is a thing yeah, rather it's than specific. Broad. It's, broad concept. Yeah. it's very so, important that people understand that. So I think it's good that they didn't like have Garnet say, it's a violation and stare at the camera. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think that the closest they got to that is that she said fusion is a choice. These gems were not given a choice. It's not right. It isn't fusion. Yeah. Which also keeps it in story. Cause I think these work best if the in universe part is completely intact that you should be able to compare to real world things. That's fine. But it should, the best way to do it is if this had no real world analog, it should still stand on its own feet. Even if those feet are stuck to hands and this one does. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The way that they talked about it was made more sense in, in universe than it did as an allegory for anything else. Hmm. So it's not quite, sometimes it's just a cigar territory, but Mm -hmm. they went just enough to, hit on the principle of choice and consent and sort of draw back, keep that as sort of a general moral rather than an explicit allegory. Right. And in this show, until we met Garnet, we didn't know that a fusion could be like a love relationship. I mean, Mm -hmm. there's a little bit of that implication with Stephen and Connie's kind of early childhood romance kind of situation, but it's not explicitly like, oh, they're in love or something. They're best friends. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if, Again, with the exception of Malachite, which I think I just have to assume is going to be a feature of any <laughs> fusion discussion we have, or all of the fusions we've seen have been by choice, whatever that choice is based on. 
I mean, Oprah right. has her problems, but both her halves went into that fully intending to to fuse and had a reason for yeah. it, and they were fine with that. Right. Sugalite right. staying together is brushing on that territory, but that sugalite, that's not that's the after effect. That's not the actual act of fusion. Right. They got kind of caught up in it mm. after it had already started and became something else on its own. Yeah. So if you want to play metaphor addiction, maybe, but we're start, again, it's starting to break down. They just, yeah, got carried away. It's kind of a problem some X-Men stories have when they try to introduce a mutant cure and they try to play it. This is an allegory for skin lightning or being turned straight or something. It's like, no, but the actual difference is that the person seeking the mutant cure can't touch another human or they'll die. Right. That doesn't have a parallel of 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 right. wanting different treatment because or rather not wanting to be marginalized is mm-hmm. uh, is a very valid thing, but it has no practical comparison of I can't stop laser beams coming out of my eyes and killing people. Exactly. So again, yeah. it's another one of, it works good when you keep the metaphor broad, but when you get specific, it breaks down. Mm-hmm. And of course, as a person that does not, you know, I'm aromantic and asexual and all that, you know, like I find that a lot of consent discussions are still extremely relevant to my life. Mm. And I'm sure you do too. So I am frustrated when people hear the word consent and assume we're talking about sex. Mm. Yeah, I mean, the people I used to mix with were sort of everyone hugs everyone people. And when right. I when I later sort of hugged someone who wasn't part of that and realized what I did, I just hated myself and quite justified. Fortunately, the person in question was like, what ifs? But it was like, right. it was, that was sort of dawning of, no, you, you should not just go and touch and hug people just because you're in the moment. You should make sure they're doing that. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes if you don't have the norms established for what your relationship is like and you make an assumption, mm-hmm. then you worry that you overstep your bounds or whatever. Yeah. Which I had, don't get me wrong. It was just in that moment, the person in question was also of a similar background. and didn't think it was a thing, but right. by all rights, I should not have done that. And yeah. if nothing else, learn to even less ever do it again. <laughs> right. And I appreciate broad discussions like that, that cartoons like this will facilitate is that when you talk about consent, it is, I mean, it's beyond even physical too, but even just sticking to physical consent for, you know, there are so many ways that we're kind of trained, especially as women to like, you know, it's fine if a man just like touches you on the shoulder when he's talking to you or puts his hand on your back while you're walking through a door. And he doesn't do that to men. He does it to you though. And you're just supposed to be fine with that. And it's like, no, no, I don't, I, I think we should change the consent conversation where you don't touch me unless you know that I want you to. Well, in fact, yeah, that's uh, the other know? half of that's the other half of the story I just told that this was back when the cons- this was about the time the consent conversation was shifting to make us more aware of such things. And I think that did mm-hmm. happen around the turn of the century. And jumping back mm-hmm. into fiction again, sometimes you watch things now that were completely innocent and taken and intended as such, and you're like, oh, that's, that's nasty. Like anything about a love potion now. Yeah. Like we all watched, people our age watched countless things where love potions were just a thing and it was just part of the story and you just went with it. And yep. now you go, whoa, whoa, hang on. What, what is this? How did I think this was okay? How did they think this was okay? Mm-hmm. Right. It, so, yeah. It's like the one way in which Quantum Leap hasn't dated well because it's dated surprisingly well for a 30-year-old show is that every time our hero is intimate with someone, he's doing so by deception because he's quite he's so literally pretending to be someone he's not yep yeah there was a lot of that in our movies a lot of you know people getting tricked into sex because they thought it was someone else or whatever and it's rarely shown as you know it's shown as sort of wrong but then if the person liked it then it's okay Mm. (laughs) and the lie behind it is not even considered really it's just like well you know whatever yeah. This I happened. Because it used to be the love potion thing. You go, oh, if they're changing their emotions to make them love the person, that's okay because it loves they love the person. But now we right. take a step back and go, oh, it's the changing their emotions in the first place that's the problem. Right. Yeah. You know, it's the same reason that you can't assume that you have consent because the person is asleep and can't push you away. Yeah. Well, there's a problem right there of sleeping beauty. Right. <laughs> 
But I will say now, if you find I've been in a hundred year long coma and a kiss will wake me up again, I do give you consent to do that specific thing. Right. Yeah. Further kisses will be discussed. Yeah. But again, that if you look at it too closely, it breaks down thing. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So in this case, I guess like the sleeping thing is sort of like this was done to these gem shards while they were not aware of what was going on and they awake to this and they find that it's, you know, they're in the process of being violated by, you know, something that they can't escape from. And, you know, Garnet is seeing this and having, you know, having her reaction to it and what she sees is, you know, not only that her dead comrades are met this end, but that she had that conversation with Stephen about consent. She's thinking about how they were introduced into each other's consciousnesses on whatever level that they were and made to be this gestalt thing Mm. when they didn't want to. They had no no say in it. And that's what she's brooding about. And I love seeing that she's still thinking about it sometime after and really it really got to her that she's still thinking about it afterwards, you know? One of the things that compounds is just how many levels it's horrible, particularly to Garnet. There's yes. the perverted fusion thing. There's the these are her, her friends thing. There is probably some our opponents are trying to make super soldiers to wipe us out thing, which, you know, worth considering. Mm-hmm. And not to mention that even if you've never met these people, this is some pretty desecrating a corpse stuff. And most people aren't okay with that. Yeah. Although I guess I have to make a reference to if in Fribo, Pearl was just like carrying these shards around and talking about how gems used to use them. Mm. Okay, maybe they don't quite have the same desecrating a corpse culture as we do. Right. I'm just wondering how that works because I don't know. I'm I'm still kind of unsure about whether and to what extent the personalities remain when things are shattered mm. because it almost seems like there might be gem energy used to power things like Jasper's, what do you call that? The gem destabilizer. It kind of looked like maybe it had a gem in it that was Mm. the source of the power or that they use these as power sources, but I don't know if they're people. Yeah. So hard to know. Yeah, because I used Um, to assume there was a larger gem ecosystem before we found out all the gem creatures we were seeing were actually gem people. And that just re-raises the question, are all of the gems we see gem people or are some of them actually just shiny rocks? Right. (laughs) And they know the difference and are bewildered by us not knowing the difference. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) It'd be like assuming (laughs) that if we made a chair out of wood, it's the same as making it as of the organic matter of a person. Right. It plainly isn't to us. Right. Well. And also we've got the impression from Lapis that gem culture, gem homeworld, gem pyre hasn't exactly become more touchy-feely and enlightened over the past few thousand years. Yeah, not based on the examples that we have been offered. <laughs> and if, even, even Lapis, who was prepared to just kind of go home if she thought it was still as she left it, effectively popped up and said, oh, no, you guys, it's all screwed up now. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. Mm. It's like, yeah, I used to conquer a few other planets, subjugate a few other races, but no, no, we've gone too far now, guys. <laughs> yeah, it seemed like she mostly focused on how oh, things are so advanced. I can't understand it, mm. you know, what, what has become of things. Yeah, I also she hasn't the, really said. I got the impression she was sort of pretty appalled on a moral level, especially when she physically returned. Mm-hmm. Because while she didn't say much, she didn't seem impressed with the whole thing and seemed a bit, what if we all just stopped this and left these people alone? Wouldn't that be fine? Yeah. And she tried to tell Stephen By these not people, I largely like mean them. me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's not place her two up there. She is still kind of selfish <coughs> on some. Well, yeah. she might have redeemed herself by sacrificing into Malachite, but we'll see if we ever revisit that. Yeah. It's very complicated. And it almost seems like she may have known she had the capacity, like, to do something really r- ridiculous and self-destructive like that and was trying to avoid getting there by just withdrawing from everything. Anyway, oh, so so we got to see Peridot. Didn't get to see Lapis or Jasper. Oh, well, we they're, still, they're still having a swim as far as we know. What's that? They're still having a swim as far as we know. Yes, yeah. I guess Garnet didn't mention her yet. 
in this episode, she was focusing on Peridot, but she was looking for Malachite when she was digging around during love letters. Yeah, well, I, so I guess it's also on her mind. Yeah, I guess they're kind of two different threats to them at this point. Yep. Because Malachite may still be chained up at the bottom of the ocean and may still be fused and either of them may have got proof or just died somewhere along the line, but at least we know what they were at when last we saw them, whereas Peridot is most definitely active and working on something. Yes, with her spreadsheets of death. Yeah. <laughs> oh. hmm. Or it's just it really organized thanks to Pearl's good. And it's Thursday is look for Peridot Day. Friday is, is investigate Malachite Day. Sun, Sunday? <laughs> Open day, in case any new threats, we discuss them then. We don't have to worry about Stephen going to school because he doesn't appear to go. Yeah, well, he barely knows what it is. Yeah, he never asks follow-up questions. So who wears those socks anyway that he was pairing at the end? He doesn't wear socks. Yeah, maybe Connie left, <laughs> a, couple of, maybe Connie left a couple of pairs behind. Yeah, remember there was a pile of laundry in the Frybo episode when he was looking for his pants. And there are some clothes in there that he doesn't seem to wear. And I know they were yeah. supposed, I know the colors of the mismatch socks were supposed to suggest sapphire and ruby, but they, to me, yeah. looked like the trans colors. So, yeah, <laughs> like a more pale pink, whereas ruby is more red. Mm, the same with the blue because sapphire is a deeper, more medium blue. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They sort of telegraphed a, a sort of fusion reference i guess from the beginning when steven made that offhand comment about how he thought the folding would go faster if ruby and sapphire were there they do that a lot in these shows in these episodes where if they mention something earlier you know the whole the yeah, whole the check- whole thing the checkoff's gun thing yeah. well it also gave steven an arc for this episode of mm-hmm. realizing how deep fusion was to to garnet mm-hmm. that it's not just well it's not just for laundry and things mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, she's said before that it's not a trick for dinner parties and stuff, but now he knows more about why that would be true for her. Oh, I don't know. It's just, it's really cool to see them having a sustained conversation where Garner's not just avoiding everything he says or Mm -hmm. telling him he'll find out or he'll, you know, or being so silent. She really opened up to him. And In the same had, episode that she told him, like, hey, you're part of the team. You're a crystal gem, too. That means you, right? Yeah, and, and we had so. said, and that was kind of a milestone in itself, which might represent a slight shift in the relationships that he is absolutely, definitely a crystal crystal gem in so many words as of this episode. Yeah, he was so officious about it. He was <laughs> marching around, looking for Peridot. He's doing this thing. I mean, we've kind of talked before as if he is, but I think this is the first time they said it to him on camera. And so that was, that was nice. Mm-hmm. Like they've, there was one time in, let's see which one, Warp Tour, when Garnet said to him, like, I should have listened to you, you're a crystal gem too. But that wasn't in the context of a mission. That wasn't like, oh, we trust you with this mission. Mm. Come with us because you're part of the team, that you're an important part of this investigation or whatever. Yeah, this was an explicit, if I say all the crystal gems, that includes you. Yeah, like definitely a step up for him because absolutely pretty much all of season one, if he was along, you felt like they were kind of humoring him. They were like, okay, is this one too dangerous for him? Well, we'll let him come along. Whereas when they thought something really big was happening, like in the return and jailbreak, they tried to send him out of town. (laughs) Yeah, it was a cool development for him. Yeah, he's growing up a bit, not much, because it has only been a year or two. Yeah, I guess we're not really, sh- I'm not really sure. We've had a, a marker for winter when all that stuff happened with winter forecast and then the New Year's stuff in maximum capacity. And he hasn't had another so, birthday, but they could easily have just not had an episode about it. Oh, uh, well, they had fake birthdays for the gems. They haven't had a Stephen birthday as such, so we don't really Oh, that's know right. Yeah, I keep, I keep thinking that was his birthday was tied up in that as well, but it was just the other's birthdays or non-birthdays. It was, yeah, it, was a, it, was, it was the birthday episode of Steven Universe so far. But yeah, he was yeah, just trying it was to just not actually the birthday time. episode of Steven Universe. Right. What was it? It was Beach of Palooza happened. So that may be a measure of time, but when it's Beach of Palooza time again. Yeah, but definitely think, New Year New Year's think, Day was a time marker. Yeah, I don't think we've seen anything which is an assumed annual event happened more than once. Right. 
and summer vacation. Stephen got really excited about summer mm. vacation. And I don't think there's been another explicit mention of summer vacation yet. Yeah, so short events they could have just not had in an episode, but summer vacation seems significant enough. <coughs> yeah. Not to mention that during winter it actually becomes winter, and that hasn't happened again. Right, that they had real snow and stuff. Mm. So, hmm. so a year or so seems a good guess. A year or so, yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's probably yeah. something they're deliberately not pinning down. Yeah, it's hard enough to figure out when you've got all these thousands of years of gem history. Like, I don't want to worry about last week. <laughs> mm, yeah. We can ask Petey and his potato calendar. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the other thing. All dates are just referred to in relation to the present. <laughs> yeah. So much as we've joked about how younger Greg seems to exist in some merged 60s through 80s thing, we don't have an exact idea of how long ago it was before, before now. Yeah. It's true. And Peridot had something that sounded like a gem date. She was saying she was saying her log date when she came up. I guess without knowing how gem time works, that's nothing for us. Yeah, there's nothing there for us. But yeah, her logs are dated. We could ask her, but it wouldn't make sense. Yeah, they just got um, gem star dates. Yeah, that was really, I mean, as I mentioned, I almost wet myself when she came up the first time I saw it. But he, I like when she asks him, are the others with you? And he goes, he starts shaking his head and then he just starts nodding and just like, he's just like, I can't lie. He just couldn't yeah. even lie to his enemy. It's so Stephen. He's such a but bad liar. Speechless. Not in a sense of yeah. telling lies that can be seen through, but that he can't actually commit himself to do it in the first place. It's just so cute. I love it. But she like civilly asks him first. She doesn't try to attack him. I, mm. think, I think she's still grappling with, what is a Stephen? Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Have Stevens replaced humans as the dominant species on Earth? She's probably got a log <laughs> somewhere about those other Stevens messing with her pod. Yep, <laughs> probably the other Stevens. And if she ever destroyed got, by other Stevens, and if she mm-hmm. ever got wind of Stephen and the Stevens, that's only going to confuse her further. Right. Yeah, we probably better not even broach that subject. <laughs> Yeah, and I like that Peridot revisited her insult. She called them crystal clods this time. I like how much sense Claude makes as a gem insult and that it is also yeah. an English insult, so it just works perfectly. Exactly. It's so great. I'm surprised there aren't more of them yes. that they've used. Yeah. So we could probably count on Peridot to come up with them if they exist. Yeah, though she does <laughs> seem attached to Claude a couple of times now. Yeah, yeah, once in jailbreak and now she's done it again. Although this time now it's crystal clods while she's running away and being very cartoony. I suppose given so what funny. Jasper said about Pearl, that she was a Pearl, mm-hmm. Peridot can be forgiven thinking that Stephen's, Stephen is Stephen's species because she comes from a world where you just have the name of what you are as your name. Yeah, which implies less individuality. So she might, yeah. she might not have any idea that someone who is called Stephen is anything but a Stephen. Yeah. I'm going to ask to pause for a second so I can get some water. Okay. Okay. Yeah. In fact, I'm going to do the same thing. All right. Just a slight hiatus. Um, <laughs> oh, we were, we were talking about paradox awareness of other species. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Any other observations about paradox for this episode? <laughs> no, for, for all she was a key element, she wasn't actually in it that much personally yeah she had that staring off with Stephen, and th- then she fl- then she flew away pretty much yeah i think uh, the the weird pillars that contained creepy fusion experiments that we saw them in come out of the ceiling sort of in mm. a much earlier episode we saw those back in marble madness i guess and it's the same little pillars that she was trying to check from afar and and this time Garnet said, Garnet said she was it, she's pulled these out from the walls. Yeah. So I think I think they were aware of them, and something has been done with them. And this right. episode, we found out what. Yeah. Interesting sort of misdirection <coughs> they did. They were they're like watching these pillars and sort of starting to shake, and then while we're focusing on that, that's when that that hand foot thing fell on Stephen. <laughs> And it's like, oh, something creepy fell from the ceiling. So, oh my God, that used a lot of 
horror techniques. <coughs> yeah. Mm. Yeah, there's definitely the middle bit is high horror as far as this show goes. Mm. Trying to think of when we would get something this creepy again. I'll just say it's a when. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. well, we've seen Ooh. them go horror tropes before, like in the, the Lars and Ronaldo episode. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Same borders. Yeah, there we mm-hmm. go. So they might have marked themselves out as the horror people. It seems like they use Raven and Paul primarily for the horror stuff and the Lars and Sadie stuff. Oh, there are episode, exceptions. But... That episode must huh? have been right in their wheelhouse then. Yeah, yeah. And they're like, oh, we got to have Ronaldo in it too. Oh, man. But uh, yeah, their first one together was Frybo. So that was pretty horrific and also included gem, gem shards. Yeah. And I guess their next one, though, was Tiger Millionaire, and that was not remotely any of these things. Although there, Lars and Sadie were in the audience over there and having reactions to their to the Tiger Millionaire drama. Yeah. I guess you don't want to pigeonhole them too much as well. Yeah, yeah. So then they had Stephen almost die from aging in the next episode, which was the So Many Birthdays episode. I'm just like kind of going through what I remember as Raven and Paul episodes and thinking, yeah, something horrific pretty much happened in every one of them. They didn't do the one where Pearl died, though. That was Jeff and Joe. And indeed, that was also a far more conceptual horror. That's true. Stuff happening on screen. She got yeah. stabbed, but she actually got stabbed pretty cleanly. There wasn't monsters cleanly. coming out of the woodwork. I was surprised they weren't behind ro- the Roses Room episode because that one was very disconcerting with the you know the room changing into a messed up version of Beach City and freaking everybody out. I was surprised that, that wasn't given to them. They got the Sugalite episode though, and they got Joking Victim. <laughs> yeah, from which what were back to back. From what I've mm-hmm. seen, and granted, I don't have them quite as on call in my head as you do. <laughs> it it does seem that they're the one you want well for horror but horror if you're you want someone who knows how to how to draw things right and then how to draw them a bit wrong to get the point across yeah they were also in, responsible for an indirect kiss which very much disturbed you because of the way that what they did to amethyst's form well yeah spot on yeah 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 and yeah you, you needed someone drawing amethyst's Strangely for that, you need someone who would let loose of her turning into spaghetti limbs and blobifying right. and all the rest. Right, which was partly funny, but you couldn't laugh because of what it was. And like yeah. this one, the single hand and foot thing on its own was pretty straightforward, but you needed someone going yeah. a bit wild when it came to the other creatures. Right, yeah. Especially the idea of them... Flopping around everywhere because even once the monster was quelled for the minute, there were still like fingers connected to legs and arm hand. No, arm hands is normal. Foot hands and arm knees and all the rest. Just yeah, bouncing around like fish whipped out of the water. Right, and if you see it as kind of a rubbery cartoon drawing, it's not maybe quite as disturbing. But if you think about like if limbs joined to each other with different skin tones and stuff were mm. writhing around flopping mindlessly and sightlessly crawling around that fell out of the ceiling like that would be absolutely super creepy and horrible well that that's what makes this one of the things that makes this scarier than the last time we saw shards turning into body parts this was this was bits all stuck together and we got a glimmer of an insight into if they've got any mind or not. Whereas last time you really just got the impression they were just parts bouncing around. Right. Which was disturbing enough on its own, but I think nowhere near as what you got out of this episode. Yeah. Yeah. This is unprecedented territory for this show. Um, And you really start to feel, especially after you see it and then you hear Garnet brooding about it later that she's like, this is not okay. And their sort of increased level of evil has been revealed like that they're willing to do this to their own people for whatever Mm -hmm. reason they have, you know, whatever philosophy is behind it, they're monsters. And that's why you couldn't have done this apart from obvious plot beat. You couldn't have done this story much earlier because you need to understand as well as comprehend all the things that are being done in this episode. Yeah. If you don't know that our crystal gems at the end result of a rebellion and a few battles and wars and things, if you don't know 
a few rounds of how fusion works. If you don't understand how a damaged gem damages a gem, and if you haven't felt this really weird off hands off but things are going downhill of homeworld mm. you need all that to get the most out of this episode because a lot yeah. of it's easy to comprehend oh gem shadow when they die oh fusion's a thing oh they used to have comrades but you won't feel it as much if you haven't had it set up for the past 59 episodes 100 percent uh, you know, they say that there's a lot of filler in the first season and I've, you know, we've had that conversation before, but like, I feel like the pacing was really on point at this point that they sh- they figured out when to show us everything so that it would never feel like they were cramming all these puzzle pieces in a specific order to lead us to this. But when we see it, they've put everything so that we do understand it as a complete picture. They did that really well. And he probably didn't want to do it much later because of how it's married to the search of a peridot. Yeah. So if you did it much mm-hmm. later, just be, oh, have they found it yet? No, they haven't. Oh, they found it yet? No, they haven't. Right. And at this point, there's been, I guess, two episodes where they were searching for her. One for when they found the pod and then this one where they found her but didn't get to keep her. And it's kind of starting to feel like pursuing this elusive cartoon villain. It's like how many more times can they do that before they, something has to happen where they either catch her or some or she becomes unreachable because just chasing the same villain every week and starts to become boring kind of cartoon fare. Like there always has to be something that foils their plans. So yeah, we should, they've got closer to working out what Peridot might be doing and Peridot, as far as we can tell, because it's mostly coming through her log updates, is easing closer to what she's actually up to. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you have to wonder in this one, like, what is her next step now that she got what she needed, as she said? Is she trying to get back home with her data or what's going on? Yeah. She, from what we saw this week, she seemed content to at least continue her work while she's on Earth. But yeah, it didn't sit. It seems like something we'd know if she'd made a proper reconnection with Homeworld. Yeah, there was that line, wasn't there, where, when she said, I'm still stuck on miserable planet or something mm. like that. Because, you know, cartoon villains always have to call it miserable planet. <laughs> funny but you know now that she's done her mission if that was all of it i guess the next step would be getting off miserable planet and she was supposed to have a ship and that ship got wrecked so and her pod also got wrecked yeah, well, and she was supposed to be able to warp in and out and that's not a thing now <laughs> go to earth they said it'll be easy they said <laughs> so the plan was probably be for her, her to be able to just like warp in for an afternoon at a time sort of poke the growing super soldier abominations a bit make some notes and go back and file her report and she was trying to work remotely initially but they destroyed her stuff <laughs> so yeah, she I, had to come to earth what very much like the idea that it is only completely by accident that this nobody has ended up in what has turned out to be quite important things in the scale of homeworld and the wars and everything. Mm-hmm. It kind of seemed like, I know this is a bit of a throwback, but it kind of seemed like when she first talked to Stephen and the gems leaped out to make their speech about we're, we're the crystal gems and we're still the guardians of this planet. She's like, the crystal gems? So like... Maybe it's not common knowledge that anything went down there. Well, I've got the impression, she's never said as much. I got the impression Mm -hmm. that she is significantly younger than the others and was simply not around for the events that sent the Crystal Gems to Earth and had that all those big battles and wars that we keep finding leftover pieces of. Yeah, um, fair assumption. But um, so, I guess there's no history class for gems because they're probably ashamed of whatever the hell happened. Yeah, and if they're all sort of austere and functional, then they probably don't tell her anything about that when she doesn't actually need to know it. Yeah, need to know basis, especially if you're just like cis admin and you don't know what happened in the battles. Like, that's military crap. Who cares? I'm just going to fix this computer and build some robots that squirt, squirty goo. And you get the impression, particularly from when Jasper turns up, that Homeworld thought the crystal gems were done, were no longer an issue. Right. Certainly didn't expect a handful of them to still be active and to have the state of mission of defending Earth. They probably just thought it's been thousands of years. We can just pick up where we left off on that planet. Yeah. We need a spare kindergarten to fire up some things. We know there's one there. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Which means that Peridot is also just nowhere near as 
impressed with the idea of rose quartz and crystal gems and whatever because that's just not supposed to be a thing she's supposed to have to deal with yeah she doesn't care about how significant this is to jasper who you know was ranting about how she was there in the first war or whatever but she never got to meet rose court yeah at most it'd be like if you went over to england and suddenly some roundheads bounced out at you I also got the impression, though I think this might be as much sort of alien arrogance, that it wasn't so much she didn't expect humans to be around as she just didn't think they were remotely significant. Right. Yeah. She didn't care if humans were the dominant species or whatever. Just like, oh, freaking organic life or whatever. And she probably certainly hasn't anticipated or even, well, she probably noticed if she's been wandering around, but she probably thought there was still all in caves and just eating what berries they found and didn't expect them to invent cities and houses and the internet and everywhere else. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Be interesting to see if, what Peridot would think of our internet. <laughs> yeah, well, I wonder if she can use her various hand tablet things to get on if she tried. <laughs> I'd pay to see that. <laughs> As you may imagine, I do not have any food for this episode, which is a good thing. I was going to say. It- not appetizing. <laughs> <laughs> you might throw up if you have food this episode. Didn't like make a marzipan hand stuck to a foot or something. Would have had to if somebody tried to eat it, but thank yeah. goodness nobody is gross like that. Not even amethyst. Not even amethyst, but to be fair, we did cut away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so nobody ate anything in this one, so I didn't have to make any recipes. Any requests? Nobody was in the mood to sing. I was going to say, yeah, a song would have completely thrown this one, no matter what mood it was. Yeah, the background music during that horrific scene was so disturbing to, I believe it was called Gem Shards, appropriately. Yeah, they have a lot of does, but it says Natin names for the music. Yeah, and when when you listen to it, of course, I have the instrumental soundtracks and stuff. And when you listen to this one, like the more times that you listen to it, if you can stand it, you can hear weird little like homages to other songs or backwards versions of them or whatever. Like there's even one really super disturbing bit where I hear a little strain from the chorus of Stronger Than You, which is sickening, you know. Effective, but sickening in the fact. Yeah, yeah, it's not great. But the sort of feeling like there's a bunch of little melodies tangled together is so perfect. Mm. And it still becomes something that's overall just dissonant and scary. Like the Michael That's Fusion. what they want. They don't want to just yeah. go for the generic Hatter and Fugue thing. They want you to yeah. know how deeply messed up this is. They were pulling no punches. Yeah, the very beginning of that, there's some kind of very deep percussion, like these sort of booming, spaced out drum beats that reminded me a little bit of a similar scene in like the Lord of the Rings movies when they were going to get harassed by orcs or something. And that works so well as like foreboding feeling of something terrible is coming. And I just, oh, I can't imagine it having been done better. (laughs) So Dale got it down this week. Yeah, they reused a couple of other background ones, like Paradot One, I think a little bit from the jailbreak reunion mm-hmm. that when I think that was when Garnet was talking to Stephen on the laundry hand. So that's really all we can say for music. But I really wanted to give a shout out to that, the new one, Gem Shards one. So that is something that is some orchestration there. <laughs> it's amazing. So creepy. This is not so often like that I will say, wow, they did such a great job on this. I never want to listen to it. <laughs> Of course, I still do. But, you know, when you see it, it's visceral reaction, you know. And, you know, incidentally, the Stephen Baum thing, you know, happened at a time in my life when I was just like, this was the first Stephen Baum that I had become a fan. And then I found out that it was coming. I was like really, really, really invested. (laughs) So I don't know. It was just really electric at this time. This was one of the best times in the story for me. And then I got this one (laughs) about the crisis of my favorite character, you know? So anyway. You got hit where you hurt just at the right time. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like any, you know, Garnet crisis episodes, which they are few and far between, as you might imagine, she usually does have it together. But, you know, any one of them will undo me as well. I really, you know, I can talk more about my thing with Garnet in a future one in more explicit terms, I think. But it's definitely very personal to see some of her reactions to these things because they'll have parallels in my life. And, you know, although I'm not lesbians in a trench coat, so... (laughs) In case you were wondering. 
<laughs> Those means in a trench coat, or as I call it, shoes. Yeah. I mean, if I was, I'd probably be taller. <laughs> but at least have that. Go check out our merch table. So I want to kind of go out of our usual order and do my merch thing next before I talk about any factoids I have because I need to do a magic trick for you. So, Ooh, hello. Yeah. I, so I want to show you my cool mug, which is has garnet on it. Mm-hmm. And on either side, it has ruby and it's sapphire. Yep. Nice. Very cute. Uh, and it's obvious why I picked that for this, but it is a color change mug. Uh-huh. So I got some water. <laughs> I got some <laughs> hot water and it'll only be hot for so long. So I better do it now. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to let you watch me do this and I'll put a visual version of it on the visual version of our podcast when the time comes. So hopefully it's still wet enough, still hot enough to cause the reaction. Also, I have some hot chocolate in here and I want to drink it. So let's hope that it's hot enough to change the color in the mug. Changing yet? At the moment it's hard to tell because it's reflecting the monitor. Oh, so now, I can, now I can see it. There we go. It just kicked in. So on Ruby's side, it starts to turn. It's a black mug, but it starts to turn red. And Garnet's is kind of a more muted, sort of whitish, purplish. You can and see on the sapphire side with the blue. Blue, yeah. And on Garnet's muted thing, you can kind of see the edges of that, which is just perfect. Yeah. Oh, that's cute. That's pretty. I, I like I that. It'll go, I don't know if it's, I don't have enough water, but. As it gets all the way to the top, there's a little more becomes visible with some words above their heads. Ooh, okay. So if we have, see, I have some nice, I'm drinking hot chocolate. Sapphires is starting to come through on this side. I don't know if you see it yet, but words are starting to form at the top. I can see, I can see the bottom, but I can't see what it is. That's oh, is that the, saying is that liquid patience? Isn't, it does. It says patience. So I'm trying to have some patience while I show my my magic trick to you. Ruby's side does not seem to be coming all the way, but it is a reference to the song. So uh, Sapphire's line was, she said, I am their fury, I am their patience. patience. So this side's fury. Uh, the very bottom of fury is coming. Yep. Fury, I am their so, patience. I am a conversation. And Garnet says conversation. Uh-huh. Awesome. I was a little worried about overfilling it, so I didn't get it all the way to the top. Yeah, but eventually it, it does kind of convey all the way to the top when it's full of hot liquid. Yeah, so, when you tilt it toward the camera, the bit it just kicked in enough to read it. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to do without spilling on my keyboard. So uh-huh. it's not perfect. That's yeah, a good you can one. Kind of see it now. And it refers to my favorite song too. So gold. Yeah. So it's a good one for this episode since they sort of had a conversation and we almost sort of saw them. <laughs> Um, Stephen kind of asked, kind of like, Stephen huh? didn't use the actual word fury and patience, but didn't ask, but did ask about their separate traits being separate or not. Yeah, wisdom and strength or whatever. Yeah. That he wanted to know more about them. And, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of like him at this point. I'm just like, you know, I really enjoyed finding out about her situation, but now I know more specifics about them and I don't know anything yet besides that they desperately wanted to find each other and the kind of basics of their personalities. See how that's getting a lot clearer. Yeah. Oh, I can definitely read conversation now. Yeah. I used to, this used to be my work mug, but then I was worried that I was going to mess it up by using it every day at, at the office. A few of my coworkers got to watch it change with me and they were like, what is that about though? And I'm like, yeah, I'm not going to explain it. <laughs> Mm -hmm. But, you know, it sucks because I want to know, you know, I want to understand these characters at this point, but I also don't want Garnet to have to unfuse. So it's like, what situation, whatever, it's not laundry, clearly. So... When, when could we spend some time with them when it wouldn't be a crisis? Because then you'd have them, but you'd have them crisis again. Yeah, the only, the only time we saw them apart, they were forced to, quite literally. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's like this made me, this episode made me very curious about what drives them as individuals. How do they know each other? How did they fall in love? You know, what is there to know about them besides their relationship, you know? So I'm sad that in order to get that, there would have to be a crisis. And it's, yeah, uncomfortable (laughs) because I love them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we now know, you know, the aftermath of who they became and not as much about them as individuals. Mm -hmm. I'm learning new things all the time. I guess I have a couple of bits to say for the factoids. I'm looking for the description. Here it is. Stephen and the Crystal Gems revisit the kindergarten and find a dark secret. <laughs> and how? Yep, yep. That's what they did. Mm-hmm. No argument here. And we know this is the third episode of the Stephen Bomb. Five episodes. It hasn't really seemed super, super connected like like the first Stephen Bomb. Yeah, there's not, there's not a through line in terms of plot or theme. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, because we had the sword fighting thing with Pearl. And then we had Ronaldo. And then we had this. Yeah. <laughs> In some ways, you couldn't have three more different episodes. Mm -hmm. Are you expecting that to continue in the fourth one and the fifth one? Having them being the, the only episode different. we've had so far that could be different enough to continue the theme of not matching the others to be Steven's universe. Would be what? Steven's universe. Sorry, Garnet's universe. All right. Oh, Garnet's universe. Yeah. Oh, goodness. <laughs> Yeah, that was a weird one. Mm. The only thing I can think of that I haven't already kind of gone over where we talked about who did the boarding and we talked about one of the callbacks that I feel like the reference to the gem shards creating limbs was kind of a throwback and that might be factoidy. The only thing I can think of is I don't know if the camera lingered there long enough for you to notice this, but you you, you do tend to notice things. So I wouldn't be surprised if you remember it. Next to the chore wheel, there was a note to buy engine oil. Oh, I started to read that, then it cut away. <laughs> so I noticed it, but didn't quite take it in. I thought that was funny. The engine oil note, because evidently they're still out because Amethyst wanted it for her sandwich. They yeah. Didn't have oh, it. May maybe they got some of it out again because Amethyst has <laughs> developed a whole cuisine based on it. Because Amethyst is Amethyst. She might have even started her own tube tube channel cooking with engine oil. <laughs> And then somebody gets sent to her house to issue some kind of warning that she's leading the kids to eat noxious substances. I mean, let's face it, on our earth, one of the top rating YouTube shows is about sticking something in a blender and seeing if it will blend. So I don't know that one. Oh, it's literally called Will It Blend? <laughs> and I've well. just explained the premise as concisely as it comes. <laughs> Well, I don't know if I'd watch that. I haven't. I've just heard about it so much, but that shows how much of a thing it is that people are just dropping stuff in a blender and it's caught on. So cooking with stuff you can't actually eat, yeah, that can go right next to that. Yeah. One trend I've seen a lot of is like somebody starts to make a food that looks extremely appetizing and then ruin it somehow and everyone, you know, all the comments are angry. Amethyst might have and got a backwards version. Remember there was a thing of people showing all those cakes that didn't look like cakes until you cut into the object? Oh. Yeah, people make cakes looking like things. Yeah, she mm -hmm. might have understood that the wrong way around and decided ah. instead to make food that's not made out of food. Mm-hmm. That would be a very amethyst thing to do, especially since she would be able to enjoy it and no one else could. Yeah, she'd be all like, the Surgeon General tells you not to smoke, but there's a Surgeon General tell you not to make pate out of oven cleaner. <laughs> yeah, people have decided that her consumption of these impossible items is just camera tricks, but she's really doing it. <laughs> hmm. Wonder what it would look like if she got like, you know, an ultrasound. And it was like only the food was showing. It probably looked similar to the floor of her bedroom. <laughs> Before she ate the one, that is. Well, if she had a five-year-old burrito in there, who knows what kind of ancient food that's in there that's still edible by her standards. Yeah, Pearl. So we can't die by food poisoning. And Amos is like, hold my beer. Yeah. She's like, I'm going to be the first. I don't know. I like to say that personally, I don't have a lot of feeling like I am, that I don't find Amethyst all that relatable to me, even though like I like her. But today I was trying to decide if food was too spoiled to eat. I'm like, is that mold or is that just like a weird colored thing on the top of my spaghetti sauce? And I determined that it was just a weird colored thing and I ate it and I'm fine. Yeah, I get that. I go, is that mold under the lid or is that white just a reflection? Yeah, I don't know. Because I do, I don't really like like tomato sauce on my pasta. I use very little of it. So it takes me a long time to go through a can of it. And more often than not, when I want it again, I open a can and it's clearly off. But, you know, I mean, statistically or scientifically or whatever, there has to be a time between when it's fine and when it's obviously bad that it's kind of bad. It's getting bad somewhere in there. So I just don't know how to tell that. It didn't smell bad and I ate it hours ago, so I am probably fine. Unlike gems, humans can die from food poison, so I probably don't have it. I have a lot That's of very spicy oil. things, so their shelf life is like longer than me. Uh, <laughs> I guess I'm like the opposite that I can't handle spices very well. So I had a really good smoothie today that incorporated spinach that's on its way up on its way out and i'm you know sn sniffing it and i'm like okay that didn't smell unpleasant so it's probably still fine and yeah i tend to eat really old eggs a lot yeah often i eat eggs past the best before date but apparently eggs actually do last sometime after their date yeah. is 
I think it also depends how much you cook them into something. Right. I remember making that point to a friend who I was editing one of his books and he had like some some superhero who ate eggs that she later found out were like two weeks past expiration and she went and threw up. And I'm like, I assure you that would not happen. And sort of to troll him, I sent him instead of editing, I sent him just a series of photos of me eating eggs like two months past their expiration date. And I'm like, look, I'm doing it. And I did. And I was fine. So I'm, I'm amethyst, I guess, <laughs> on some level. I really am not, though. I mean, I do not eat a lot of questionable things or really very adventurous stuff at all. Well, I remember your face when a couple episodes <laughs> back when we were analyzing a huge sandwich and I said, you know, I'm not sure that is a burrito. I think it might be a haggis. Oh, yeah. When I thought something was a burrito and you, you said it could be a haggis. And you were like, your face is like, no, 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 no. As in, oh, like, even, if there, even if there's a vegan haggis, I don't want to find out because it'll still be a haggis. Yeah. I venture to say that Amethyst would be very excited to eat a haggis. Oh, that was part of my thinking. Well, that, and it looked just like a haggis, of course. Yeah. Oh. But it actually probably makes more sense to put a haggis on a sandwich than a burrito because the burrito is already a sandwich. Oh, that's cancelled out by the fact that there was a hamburger on it. That's true. So she's obviously, she's obviously fine of nested sandwiches. Right. And I kind of felt like it was a scrape everything together that was in the fridge sort of sandwich. And I don't know that Stephen would have a lot of haggis hanging around. No, I was going to say they're not generally available, but who knows how these things work on the Stephen Universe Earth, which is a bit different from ours. Yeah, I mean, for all we know, Scotland or whatever is just an island near Beach City. Or maybe they were imported a few decades ago or centuries ago and just super caught on in the United States. Right. Oh, yeah, vegan haggis is a thing. I just looked it up. Oh, don't tell me that. <laughs> <laughs> there have been a couple of recipes that when I found more information about them, I guess we can talk about this because I didn't have a recipe for this one. <laughs> so this will be a stand in. But I like I found out more information afterwards and I had to remake something with this additional information. And uh, gosh, if I find out that was a haggis, I'll have to redo that. It'd almost be tempting to write to the border or whoever and ask. But if you were that border, would you say it was anything but a haggis if someone asked you that? Right. <laughs> You'd be like, I hadn't thought of that, but uh, yeah, shit, yeah, it's a haggis. Sure, it's a haggis. Yeah. One of the things that I had to redo involves onion. So you'll get to look forward to that. <laughs> I think it's relatively soon, too. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah, it is. <sighs> so, but I can't say anymore because that is just not fair to get your hopes up about Onion. Well, it's told me that Onion will still be around. And as I regard him as more a fact of the universe and a mortal being, that's not too much a spoiler. Yeah. Onion is a constant indeed. So yeah, what else do we have to say about this very hard hitting and horrific episode? Anything else before we reveal yeah. the next episode title? And I think we might have let all those emotions out. Or if we got into the begin, we'd be here for a whole other episode. I agree. All right. I really like this Stephen Bomb. So I'm excited about the next ones too. You ready for me to tell you what the next one is called? What are we up for next? So let's see. This this is episode 60. 61 is called We Need to Talk. <laughs> I'll have to gather your predictions at the beginning of the next. <laughs> One of the most ominous phrases ever. Yikes, right? <laughs> oh, definitely not another obvious literal title. Mm. Uh, and hopefully, though, not quite as intense as finding a bunch of abominations underneath a kindergarten. Not a lot can top that, I'll say. The show likes to outdo itself in surprising ways, but I think we're I think we're safe for a little while. <laughs> All right, I guess we'll leave our listeners with that impression. Until next time when we need to talk and you need to listen. Yeah, later. That was a good one. You've been listening to Ivy and Daria on Not So Giant Women. You can find episodes of the show in video form by looking up Not So Giant Women on YouTube or in audio form at anchor.fm slash not so giant women or your podcatcher of choice. You, you can, can also, also find, find us on, on Facebook. Facebook. Audio production by Daria. Video production and music by Ivy. Daria can also be heard on Postploitation, the Ausploitation podcast. And Ivy at her Stephen Universe fan blog at love-takes-work.tumblr.com. 
Stephen Universe was created by Rebecca Sugar and remains property of Cartoon Network. No infringement is intended. I'm not unfusing for laundry.